thanks again for everybody for joining in. And I think we've got a fun group tonight uh, talking, uh, giving us a bit of a different perspective than we usually get, which is to say from the buy side rather than the, say, core technologist side that we've usually had on or the compliance side we've had on before. So these are the ones who are really deciding what is a good product for them and how they should direct money flows uh, into tokenized assets. So um, I'll do some quick intros from our side. Of course, I'm Patrick Sutton. I run comms for Ava Labs. And as always, we have Morgan Krupetsky on who heads business development for institutions recently on Twitter in the last two, three weeks, but known as the tokenization queen. So um, I'm sure that those memes will start pouring into the chat. And uh, as I said, we've got a great group today. Um, so Kevin, if you can start us off, let the audience know your name, current role, and how you made your first dollar, pound, euro, uh, yen, whatever your uh, home fiat was growing up. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um... So, name's Kevin Miao. Uh, I'm currently a partner at Block Tower, which is a uh, digital asset, uh, asset or digital asset fund or crypto native asset manager. Uh, I run one of the three funds at Block Tower, uh, Block Tower Credit, which is distinct from the other funds in the sense that we don't invest in early stage projects or digital assets. Uh, we invest in traditional credit assets, uh, issue them. Um, basically tokenize, securitize them onto the blockchain and then uh, utilize blockchain technology and counterparties to um, basically help us run a very traditional structured credit hedge fund strategy. Um, prior to this, I was at Citigroup where I ran the structured credit trading desk um, focused on ABS uh, and ABS CDOs. Uh, after that, I ran operations at a fintech lender called CapChase uh, before I you know, came here to block tower credit. Uh, in terms of first dollar, uh, I used to sell, I, I drove an ice cream truck around in my hometown of East Lyme, Connecticut. Um, so probably pretty much where I caught the entrepreneurial bug and also the best summer job of all time. Amazing. And so definitely a first on money moves. <laughs> so <laughs> we like that one. Um, Pete, do you want to go and then Colin? Sure. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin and I probably grew up together. Um, uh, so I'm Pete Lucas. I'm the, the chief investment officer at Artery Winston. We are an art and collectibles digital asset investment manager. Uh, we have two funds today. We're launching a, a third later this year. Um, the investment manager really is a JD between Artery, which is a Web3 fintech company focused on art and collectibles and Winston Art Group, which is the largest appraiser and advisory firm of art uh, in the world that remains to be independent. Um, they've done about 70 billion um, of advisory work over the past 10 years. Uh, my role is kind of institutionalizing the fund management business. We have a few different partnerships together um, and we're focused on investing in art, collectibles, uh, both on the you know real asset side as well as NFTs in the future. Um, I've been in the fintech space for a long time, uh, both as an operator and investor. And uh, the reason I got into blockchain tech is because of some of the issues that that came about more on the servicing side of structured finance. Um, my first dollar I made from clam digging. Actually, I was uh, I, I we dug five thousand six hundred. Uh, 5,000, 6,000 clams a day, um, you know, all different piping and stuff to pull them out. And that was the first legitimate dollar I think I've ever made. <laughs> legitimate <laughs> being the key, key adjective there. Mine was yeah. mine was shucking seafood and cleaning crabs all summer. So I, I can relate as a, a seafood monger. Um, and then Colin, you want to close this out with the intros? Yeah, for sure. Um, so everyone, Colin Erickson, I'm currently an independent advisor and investor in a number of fintech businesses and blockchain businesses. Um, I left a private credit fund called Victory Park in February of this past year, where I was I was there for about four years and about two and a half, three of that um, was focused on digital asset exposure. And prior to that, started my career in investment banking. Um, I can only think of the first illegitimate dollar I made. Um, we'll so, take that one too. 
I mean, it's it's pretty lame. Um, Morgan, you might like it. I don't know. But I, I was making crafts with my sister and I conned a neighbor into buying one, which I'm pretty sure my mom just gave her the dollar to buy it from us. So, um, but yeah, that was my first dollar. I don't even remember what the craft was either. Yeah, that's, was that's what you have to say. If I made a spreadsheet before <laughs> spreadsheet was <laughs> probably. This was, this was yeah, last year. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> last year a, a craft smart contract, um, <laughs> amazing. Um, so for some table setting before we get into some perspective from the buy side, um, about two weeks ago now, the Avalanche Foundation launched Avalanche Vista. Morgan's been a key driver behind that project from the Avalab side. So really want to help set the table for this discussion with uh, an intro to Vista and why you think that's such a big uh, move forward for the industry, Morgan. Yeah, sure. I'm ha- happy to kind of go into that. Um, But I would just say, and I know, Patrick, you mentioned this earlier um, in the episode, but I'm super excited for this, for this discussion, um, just because I think so oftentimes, um, the whether you want to call it RWA space or or OCA space really focuses on um, really like the, the, the issuer side or the pipeline side or the borrower side in terms of all the assets out there that are being tokenized and very kind of infrequently for a variety of reasons do we get to hear from the buy side. So I'm super pumped that we were able to get Kevin, Pete and Colin on um, who have such like a wide variety of experience, both in the traditional financial services space and now kind of um, transitioning on chain, if you will, and really kind of looking at things from a more of a traditional investor standpoint Um, And really working with protocols in a a strategic way to help them understand what types of things, offerings, tech really is institutional grade. And that's really kind of where I get excited is really bringing off chain capital on chain. And and these guys are really um, at the forefront of of partnering with a variety of different protocols and and tech providers in terms of really driving that forward. Um, and, and, And part of that, I think, is what's really driven the Avalanche Vista announcement, um, which was an announcement that basically the Avalanche Foundation would be allocating up to $50 million um, across, you know, a longer term time period to really buy assets um, tokenized on Avalanche. Um, And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, VC funds out there that are increasingly and have increasingly been focused on uh, protocols tokenizing assets. Um, but, you know, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it's a, it's a different mandate, I think they, they stop kind of at the, you know, buying of the underlying assets part of the equation. And so Vista is really meant to, to help um, step in as one of several kind of liquidity providers into a variety of different assets and asset types, liquidity types, maturity types, um, to really kind of jumpstart um, really the flywheel um, as it relates to um, the tokenization of off-chain assets. Um, again, really in partnership with, with like traditional and, and other kind of crypto native investors. Um, you know, I alluded to this earlier, but I think overall we'll definitely consider the whole spectrum of, of liquidity, of maturity, of assets. So everything from stable coins to commodities to um you know, equity, credit, infrastructure, real estate, and uh, and everything in between. I see Luigi's on the line. He's extremely excited about tokenized wine, which I'm sure we'll we'll talk we'll talk about on a, on a future money moves um, as, as well as commodities. So it's really the whole spectrum. But at a high level, three things that we're kind of thinking about in terms of um, kind of high level criteria. I'd say the first is. Um, Definitely uh, working with protocols strategically who have really thought about how what they're bringing to market is um, quantitatively better from like a process onboarding admin perspective than the traditional or Web2 or TradFi way of accessing the same asset, um, which not all protocols, I think, can can kind of confidently say um, and or bringing to market a digitally or blockchain native asset from an institutional um, uh, I- investor standpoint, um, as well as those who have a really kind of thoughtful go-to-market demand and, and distribution strategy. So not just solely focusing on crypto native liquidity, but you know what is the plan for onboarding off-chain capital um, into, into some of these assets? Um, and then lastly, I would say you know being thoughtful about 
navigating the kind of regulatory and compliance landscape to the extent that it's applicable. Um, a lot of the um, you know, assets out there are considered securities. And so how, how are these protocols kind of navigating the securities laws and regs that, that dictate wherever they're being issued and, and how they're being administered? So I said a lot, happy to dig into any of that, but let me hand it back to you, Patrick. Yeah. So first, I think maybe a table setter along with this question too, which is, I'm curious, Pete, Colin, or Kevin, which, which one of you wants to take this first? But two questions. One is, from your vantage point, what is driving tokenized, interest in tokenized assets? And then two, which is actually should be the first question, is can one of you succinctly for the crowd explain what the role is of the buy side compared to the sell side? in case not everyone has spent time in the halls of institutions or around uh, the same side. This smells like a Kevin. (laughs) Not to be on the spot, bro. (laughs) Thanks for, thanks for volunteering me. Um, Yeah, I guess I'll start with the second question first, which is uh, how does the buy side differ from, I guess, the, the rest of the ecosystem. And I would really define that, I guess, in, at least in our space, which is really kind of on the credit side of things, you have an issuer of a credit asset or a borrower, effectively. You've got some sort of broker in the middle, potentially, um, which you know would be indicative of like the desk that I used to run at Citigroup, um, which is kind of called the sell side, and it brokers transactions between borrowers and lenders, or uh, you know buyers and sellers. Uh, but that function is called the sell side, and then the buy side is really. Uh, When you think about hedge funds, insurance companies, private equity, uh, where the capital actually ends up um, and is being held for the long term um, is really what we would consider buy side. So where Colin came from before, uh, Victory Park, um, for example, where we are now today at Block Tower Credit, uh, that would be kind of the buy side. And it's important, and I think this was alluded to earlier on, because ultimately the buy side is who you're trying to reach. That's the capital that you're trying to uh, basically convince to buy a particular asset due to its risk profile, its credit, its duration, its uh, you know jurisdiction, uh, the structure, et cetera. That's who you ultimately have to convince. Um, and really in a lot of ways, I think where tokenized assets today are is there is a lot of interest in issuing tokenized securities, but there's virtually zero interest in um, purchasing the tokenized versions of those securities today. And I think that's changing very quickly, as you can kind of see, starting with tokenized treasury funds. And there's, you know, some idiosyncratic dynamics there that are not worth getting into right now. But um, those are obviously a growing sector here. um, But then also, uh, I think just overall, like, yeah, sorry. Anyways, I, I I was about to go down a rabbit hole. I don't. I, I think I've probably already spoken enough. Do it. No. Come on. This is this I is how we all met each other. Yeah. rabbit hole. It's great. Well, it's just like I'm usually used to like monologuing by myself, but we have two other excellent speakers here, so I definitely don't want to take all the air out of the room. I see Pete unmuted himself, so let me pass it over to that man. I, I, no, I just keep it unmuted to, you know, oh. like keep the, to keep the tension up, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, no, listen, I, 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 I totally agree. I think um, I look at the buy side, ultimately, listen, the capital markets are the arbiter, right, of what we should do, right? Like you don't, you don't build anything unless somebody wants it. And, you know, ultimately we have an incredible amount of technology and ways to even acquire or create novel assets that don't exist. But, you know, it, it, it's, I don't think it's the hardest thing either, but, you know, it, it's really catering to the buy side as in what is going to end up in loan format, bond format, and think about like the downstream effects of that. If it's a bank that wants certain things or can't have certain things, insurance company, same thing. If it's an actual uh, securitization, like an ABS, that requires certain things or doesn't. Um, but I think it's working backwards from some of those um, constraints, which now having been on both the buy side and the sell side of Web 2 and Web 3, there are real opportunities. Um, and, and I think some of the service providers are trying to you know, get themselves in the right position, but ultimately it, it requires involvement. You know, 
um, in you know, two ways. And I think we've been, you know, sort of uh, beyond fortunate, but maybe spoiled the last couple of years um, in terms of being able to build, you know, a lot of amazing technology and tools and hammers without, you know, doing it because there are a ton of nails out there. Colin, over to you. Um, look, I mean, I, I just think that like a, a lot of crypto over the past couple of years um, has had a lot of exuberance, um, obviously a lot of pain then thereafter. And I think that the tokenized asset ecosystem has been kind of chugging along um, under the under some of what was noise. And, you know, the the noise has come down and the signal stays steady. So, you know, the builders in this ecosystem have been doing the same thing that they've been doing for the past five years um, better than ever. And I think it just, it, it's, uh, you know, um, a little bit of a function of the new cycle that it, it kind of sits in the limelight today. Um, but I, you know, outside of what originally was just tokenized private credit assets, um, which is a lot of where the, the RWA acronym came into play, you know, as Kevin alluded to, there's now tokenized treasuries. And I think you're going to see a multitude of other asset classes that sit along the investment risk curve that are tokenized. Um, you know, whether or not all of those have a specific use case for a crypto native investor day one, PBD. Um, but I do expect the replication of the entire off-chain investment risk curve in the future. Yeah, also just, I, I think we didn't really cover too much of like why tokenized assets, but one thing that's really important to kind of note yeah. here is this is really the first major intersection point between the vast majority of traditional finance and crypto and the DeFi ecosystem. And what I mean by that is like, if you listen to Larry Fink talking about tokenization of assets being the next generation of finance, if you look at the research put out by Visa um, and the crypto and you know their crypto team, right? Like it's highly sophisticated and they're using this technology to solve real world problems. And they actually view tokenization, blockchain enabled, basically capital markets or like, you know, other kind of like ways to transfer value as, as a, as a, as just a tool to solve a problem. And that's honestly, a, that's like necessary, right? It's not about crypto and blockchain being like a hammer trying to solve all of these other problems. It's the fact that the broader industry is really waking up to the fact that, wait a second, we have these problems. We find them incredibly difficult to solve. And actually, as we learn more and more about blockchain technology, it's become something that we simply cannot ignore. We're starting to realize, wait a second, these things actually solve the problems that we're trying to solve in the first place. And I think that's, um, you know, it's a long journey, but it's very clear to me that that's one of the reasons, like that's happening. And it's one of the reasons why I think this narrative in particular is picking up recently. And Kevin, I'd, I'd ask this question to, to you and, and Colin, because I... I'm sure we'll have similar responses, but we'll see is, uh, you know, what, it, it, pick out one problem. You know, if you could, if you could solve one problem, knowing what you know, and it may be conceptual, but realistic, you know, what, what would that problem be? Maybe start with Colin, but I, I'd love to like focus on what these problems are. Cause I, I have some, but we all have our own experiences of how we got here. Oh, everyone's got to put someone on the spot at some point. Look, I mean, I would just say recourse, but I think that's a much bigger and complicated discussion. But I'm going to keep it short and sweet there. Kev, before you answer, what I would also say, just to maybe speak a little bit more illustratively, you wrote a blog. I think it's called Everything is Broken. Um, I think it was earlier this year or last year. But that one, I always go back to that one in terms of like, demonstrating concrete examples of things that how things work or don't work off chain slash and tradfi today and why and where certain aspects of putting these things on chain would be really helpful so i don't know if you were going to talk at all about that but i think that was really illustrative in terms of like your personal experience and kind of why you're excited about applying the tech to real world problems today yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's called Everything is Broken. It's on uh, Packy McCormick's blog, uh, Not Boring. So for any readers, feel free to take a look. I think it was like posted a year ago, almost to the day, actually. So I uh, totally wasn't thinking about that. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, I think to, to just TLDR it basically in a securitization, which underpins effectively everything in the U S um, from a, from a debt perspective, the cost of running a typical securitization is just to put it simply much higher than it needs to be. Um, and to reduce it down, I mean, today we've been running securitizations through centrifuge on Ethereum, where we've securitized, I think to date about $175 million worth of assets sitting in two structured products uh, on Ethereum. And we've paid something like 6.7 Ethereum total to administer this transaction um, using smart contracts. Uh, and in a traditional securitization, that might cost something like 20, 30, 35 basis points per annum to do. And so the absolute dollar delta between what we're doing um, at, you know, call it thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 at current market prices relative to what it would cost us in traditional finance, which would be well in excess of $200,000 um, at the current size that we're talking about, $175 million securitization. Like that's a very glaring, like, uh, efficiency that you can get when you automate basically these very simple calculations and distributions and everyone is on, you know, a shared database. Like everybody does like the cost of reconciliation is effectively zero. Now there's still a lot of other associated costs with us doing this because we, as the first movers in this like ecosystem have to run parallel systems. Like we still have to do everything in traditional finance. We still have to, and then we have to obviously like mold that into our blockchain like operations. Um, but the path forward is pretty clear to us, like to replace a lot of middle office and back office functions and allow those people to do higher value work by moving things away from Excel spreadsheets um, and manual entry, like fund distribution um, or money distribution to programmatic smart contract based distributions based on if then statements, which is exactly what they are. Um, that's a real world problem. It underpins or it's something that's endemic in a $14 trillion notional US securitization industry and is something that the whole industry has known since 2017, like the potential for this to happen. The technology just hadn't caught up yet. Um, and to be honest, it still isn't quite there, but it's getting closer. Uh, and I think that that's one of the really exciting things um, about the yeah. space. Well, let me, and, and look, that, that's amazing because it complements what I was going to say, you know, as the, as my sort of <laughs> purpose, how I got involved three years ago was over the past several years, I've, I, it's the wrong payment, the wrong data untimely data and untimely payment. If I had to sum it all up, I totally agree with the direct costs, you know, as, as Kevin just describes, like in detail, it just shouldn't cost as much, nor should it be as manual. My experience and reason for being here really was on the, on the asset servicing side. I, I, I can't describe it any other way other than timely and accurate payments and data. It's really what it came down to for me. Um, I, you know, I think there are two different analyses and I agree like the technology maybe, I don't think it's a technology necessarily needs to, needs to improve as much as sort of the, the operational and legal infrastructure that, you know, becomes incorporated into smart contracts or any other chain or ledger that, that you would use. Um, what I would say is that it requires, you know, the Kevins of the world, the Collins of the world, I wouldn't put myself in their category, um, but, you know, really to actually start investing and, and, and putting capital to work without it and people willing to kind of get in early and be involved. Um, it's a lot slower process. So that's kind of my my reason for for being here and my biggest problem to solve and you know turn it back over to Morgan or Patrick whoever wants it. I would maybe just add and I think you guys both kind of um, like touched on it or alluded to it that it's really these like administrative operational real world pain points that exist in the way that um, assets are you know securitized, bought into, transacted, reported on, 
these real world pain points that the on-chain solutions are really trying to solve. And the tokenization piece is just like, not ancillary, but it's kind of the output of all of the efficiencies gained with these like, with these inputs. And so oftentimes when we, when we talk to projects, they're so focused on like the asset and how are we just going to put it into tokenized form, but don't really think about the actual cost savings and efficiencies that you need to realize to make the tokenization part make sense. Right. And so it's definitely like the less sexy and exciting part of it. But in my mind, that's really where, you know, wh why it makes sense. Um, and that I, I'm, I'm glad that you guys brought that, those up as like concrete examples, because that's really in my mind where, where, where we get excited when we meet protocols that are actively thinking about it in the same way is really where I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll see the greatest impact. Yeah, two point, maybe less exciting, but also exciting to solve a problem where there's some shares where we've had issues where we don't know how many are outstanding, as in the case of Dole or in Dell, right, where we can't even fully track this, the simplest and most fundamental issues of like market infrastructure. And yet the e-trading systems on top add that to retail brokerages and you have like a, a pure mess and like spaghetti web of uh, entangled yeah, systems, and, right? And, and Patrick, think about, think about it like, it, you know, typical ABS deal, RMBS, CMBS, mm -hmm. the payments get collected over a 30 day period, calendar month, and then 15 or 21 or 25 days thereafter, yep. the payment is made. Just like without, you know, I'm not making up a bunch of stuff here. Like that's a lot of that's a lot of talking where the, the data is just out there. And I would tell you that it is a little scary from like an infosec and data sec standpoint because mm -hmm. people some people have that data or can can, you know, actually infer that from other things that are happening. And you know, that's not efficient for markets. Yeah. Information asymmetry and then access on that market can also create a skewed market away from, right. say, smaller participants. I was just looking back um, at hopefully it's, hopefully it's correct on the 25th of yeah. the month. Find out <laughs> it's not correct. Anybody, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if somebody's fax machine is out, then you can take down most of the syndicated loans market in an afternoon, you know, if it's bad enough. I was just looking back at Kevin's blog, and he talks about an example of how you're able to source a particular tranche of securitized debt to get it traded. And I, I won't read it, but highly, highly recommend, recommend it because it's like really, it's kind of ridiculous in terms of the way that it works, but it's coming from the, the sell side. It, it, it sadly still works that way. So th uh, with this basis of saying that the, the back offices, the kind of core plumbing of these markets definitely needs an overhaul. And that's where we see the biggest benefits. Are there any asset class or industries you guys think is are most equipped or most prepared to move on chain and maybe uh, can jump forward either in growth of an entire sector by the technology really overhauling all those things and making them, you know, perhaps arcane assets, you know, the syndicated loans example, uh, more accessible. I'm curious from, from your perspectives and across your various journeys to this point is like what asset classes and industries you think are, are most ready, um, or perhaps most in need of that kind of innovation. I think there are two more abstract questions that, as you just said, like one of them is what asset classes are enabled or created because of blockchain technology and tokenization? And then which ones are improved? I mean, uh, otherwise, you know, we shouldn't be talking about it. But between those two, you know, I think Kevin and I actually talked a little bit about structured credit. And the first one, novel assets, you know, I know Colin, I have a view, but Colin, uh, definitely we've spent time talking about this and I'd be curious his opinion on asset classes that are enabled by uh, DLT or blockchain tech. <laughs> Colin's just Drum trying roll. to enjoy the beat Thank you, here, Pete. Pete, and you just keep. <laughs> I know, man. It's not, no way, man. It's midnight here. It's midnight here. No, I mean, look, I, I think that we've alluded to it in this conversation thus far, right? Like, there's two things that draw institutional adoption. I think it's either cost efficiency from your middle office 
and or, you know, access to novel assets, I, I, in either case, creating kind of a superior risk adjusted return or an opportunity that couldn't possibly be, have been achieved in traditional finance. Um, you know, I, um, to kind of double click real quick on the optimization, you know, point, I, I think, you know, truth be told, yes, the infrastructure enables for superior cost outcomes, but, you know, w- when, when, um, you know, the, the, you know, pedal actually hits down, right. I'm, I'm like, to- I just totally beef that one. Um, <laughs> but when the rubber hits the road, <laughs> pedal to the, the metal, hits the road, <laughs> You pedal to the metal when you pedal to the metal or the rubber to the road. Um, you know, what I've kind of realized, at least during in my time at Victory Park, was that you really had to either incubate LPs on chain or um, port your LPs on chain. And that might have been a conversation with myself. I definitely said it to our managing partner at some point. Um, but Kevin's kind of in a unique position because he actually has a buyer for that asset so that he can actually in, uh, realize those cost efficiencies. And I'm not sure that a lot of other institutions are going to so quickly hear, hey, fantastic, I can save a few bips in my middle office and overhaul my entire process um, accordingly. So I think it's one kind of just point of caution that there's like, yes, the technical capability and then the two, how do we actually get people using it? And I think they're slightly different you know, problems to solve. But then on the novel asset front, just to suck more air out of the system, right? Um, yes, you know, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so on the novel, on the novel asset front, I think um, in particular, you want to look for assets that couldn't have existed without blockchain technology. Um, think assets that are potentially too small dollar denomination to have been put in a securitization just because of it being cost prohibitive. Um, I think one area that I'm personally really excited about is creator finance. Um, and that'll be my final answer. Nice. And, and in that, um, in that idea of, of cultivating liquidity providers on chain, what is a pitch knowing that the core, say middle office, little cost savings here and there isn't quite the most compelling yet, or that they still want to see that proven out. Right. Which I think is one of the things Morgan and I talked about for a long time leading up to this series was like that both of us have had the pain point of me as a communicator and talking to media in this space about tokenization and them say like, well, is it actually good? Like what numbers are there and that being a pain, but what are the compelling, you know, what's the compelling case you'd make to a liquidity provider to say like, you need to get on chain now. Um, and here's the opportunity for it. I'm curious for, for all three of you, really, your perspectives on that. The, the pitch is, is pretty simple. You have to invest in, in Kevin's fund or Colin's fund. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an independent advisor. I, I, I'm explicitly oh, un, not allowed to market my fund. So in these types of public... Not but I can. You know, I'm just, <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, <laughs> appreciate that. I, and yeah, honestly, scary. I think that's a, I think that's a great question. I want like one once one like kind of anecdote that I would um, pull out here, just in terms of like the middle office efficiency and like and and I'll and I'll cover the other thing and or the other question in one sec. But like, I was recently talking to somebody at Society General, a Forge, and they have built an internal kind of like blockchain re- like cross border repo. Um, or sorry, like a private blockchain to facilitate internal cross-border repo transactions across different accounts at Society General. And he was talking about it. He was super bold up. Um, and then he ended it with like the punchline of being like, hey, wow. we have saved a million dollars the last year uh, by using this technology. To which it's like, okay, like to be honest, that's not even a rounding error for, uh, <laughs> for a large financial institution. I was a little shocked to hear that. And on the other side of the coin, however, State Street and IBM, I think they did a research project back in like 2017 or 2018 about what is the cost of reconciliation globally in the financial system per year? And it approaches, in their estimation, a trillion dollars a year, right? Well, there aren't like a billion institutions out there or, uh, you know, a million or a hundred million institutions out there, whatever the like right number is, like that need to reconcile or that can build their own blockchains internally and save a million dollars. Like how do you, how do you just, or how do you like basically 
reconcile the fact that the cost of reconciliation across this balkanized system of different banks, different uh, like national payment systems, different financial institutions, different buy side, sell side, like providers. And then, and the fact that that costs a trillion dollars with the fact that when one person builds a private blockchain, they only save a million dollars on their transactions. And I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that you have to like, this is a new standard tokenized assets. Everybody has to move to the new standard in order for you to really get the benefits that we're speaking about here today. And so a lot of what we're talking about is basically just how do you build that product? How do you build that like technology so that it facilitates these efficiencies or it can actually deliver on these efficiencies. But the second part of it is honestly much more important. It's the distribution side. How do you actually distribute this technology and move a whole market in this, in this direction, using this new standard um, to actually make that benefit realized or to actually realize that benefit. And um, I'm like, basically half a bottle in on this chilled red wine that I'm drinking. So that was totally, wow. Like, we've really like, driven you know, drinking. Hor- totally horribly <laughs> executed. Um, but uh, I do think that that's like an important point to make. Like everybody has to move or it's ne- you're never going to see the real benefit. Um, yeah. and that's our number one, like goal is be- here at block tower credit is to prove that, Hey, this works on a small scale and we should all probably try and do this. <laughs> Your PR team would be happy to know that you remember their disclaimers even after a half bottle of wine. As a comms guy, I have to say, exquisite, Kevin. Nailed it. <laughs> well trained. I, I would maybe just um, just like add to that. I mean, I agree, obviously, every, with everything you said, Kevin. I think down the line, like very long line, you know, all, all assets will be tokenized where we're not necessarily distinguishing between off-chain, on-chain and tokenized and not tokenized. But just anecdotally from kind of the major traditional financial services institutions that we speak with, a lot, like 98% of them, I would say, are focused on tokenization in some way, shape or form. And most of them anecdotally are focused on like private market securities um, in the first instance, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that there's just the most, I would say, like operational efficiencies to be gained there, um, which I think, to the extent that those can be remedied or improved a little bit, that therefore makes the case for lower investment minimums and the ability to kind of facilitate a wider, more democratized investor set, which a lot of them are focused on. But also, importantly, to what you said earlier, is, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of these major incumbents have the embedded distribution channels to be able to reach, you know, this this wider off-chain or traditional retail and investor market. So it's just a matter of kind of using this tech to like slot into and make for a better, more conducive um, user experience. So it's really, it's just really like a way to kind of embed into, into these traditional distribution channels that I think is part of the thing that's going to lead to, to greater and mass adoption. I, I agree. What I would add is like, I think there are two, two threads here and I all relate it to artery, what we're doing right now. So one of them is on capital markets and the distribution around that. The second is, and, and frankly, financial product applications, like real applications, capital flows, payments, servicing, uh, capital raising, issuance, securities, et cetera. The second, which you know, I think has been a very, very interesting use case for me, has been non-financial applications, actually like the real tangible, like, you know, for, for instance, real assets, be it real estate, art, collectibles, et cetera, um, using tokenization to make transacting easier there. It's less so a financial service and much more about the operational uh, requirements and work every time you want to um, sell the artwork, every time you want to, or not you want to, every time you need to get an appraise for insurance purposes, or collateral purposes, which may be quarterly, maybe semi-annual, maybe annual. Every time you do that, it's like many work hours. And without it being like a more distinct, you know, uh, capital markets financial service, 
it actually accretes a lot of value uh, by housing that data and information and in a trusted way um, in some kind of ledger that is immutable. Outside of public records, you know, which really is sparse in terms of art and collectibles, um, you know, there needs to be a better way and a global system that's decentralized is really the approach that we take. So building that registry, we've done about a billion and a half dollars of uh, tokenized art and collectibles is, is our approach to building financial products because it's actually not a financial product initially. We'll build products on top of that. Yeah, I think, I think having a shared state of truth is something people almost take for granted because they can say, well, I can also just look at somebody's blog and I'll see the exactly. same blog or something you know that they see on the internet. But they take for granted that all of these systems are tracking data independently, sometimes have some shared state, but then has to go through their own mechanism, how they digest or ingest and then digest that data. And then you have like chaos across each, each part of uh, the system. Curious, um, what do you guys think your peers at buy side firms who are not interested in this space yet, uh, or ones who are largely feeling like writing it off, what do you think that they're really missing right now about tokenized assets and the opportunity here? I feel compelled to answer this one. No, I love um, that. Love it. <laughs> Look, I, I think at the end of the day, there's just a, a disenchantment with the ecosystem broadly because of just kind of the rampant and mass fraud that we've been plagued with. But I, I genuinely think more so than anything, there's... Um, a lack there of a realization that this is an infrastructure solution and not just a speculative asset class. And even if it's the investment professionals at the institution contemplating blockchain technology that understand the difference between those two, their LPs might not. And for many of them, there's too big of a reputational overhang in actually convincing your LPs that you're about to make a great decision um, with a novel technology solution. Um, especially if that is reputationally tagged or tied to some of the large scale frauds that we've seen. So, you know, some may be missing it in that they don't want to do the work to stay kind of tight to tokenization and, and, you know, other types of financing opportunities adjacent to it. Um, but I think even more importantly, you, you know, they, they kind of have their own masters and, and their masters basically kind of say, hey, you're out of a job if you mess this up, right? So um, I think that there's, you know, partial blame can be dealt to these asset managers for kind of ignoring things. But I think at the end of the day, every, everyone kind of has a boss and that kind of um, long tail or, or whipsaw effect is real. And it will take a while before some of these LPs really understand at scale as well. Yeah. I think that's such a great point too, like this career risk of the human beings on the other side making the uh, investment can be immense. I like for us, it's one of the reasons why we had to start our fund at a crypto native firm because we can basically be unshackled from a lot of those constraints that I used to have at City or my partners used to have at Hildeen or Exonic or other like structured credit hedge funds. And um, it is something that I think the builders in crypto have to be very objective about in terms of like <laughs> the reality of that situation. Mm -hmm. and, and it's compounded by the fact that a lot of the tokenized assets today, right, look very similar to things that you otherwise could already get in traditional finance. Um, a lot of tokenized RWA or on-chain assets today are credit assets, right? And also credit is fundamentally different, right? You invest in crypto because you think it can 100x. You never do that with credit. Credit, you know that you're only going to get your principal and interest back. And anything that goes wrong is going to basically detract from your ultimate return. And so that's a completely different frame of mind. And you can't convince people about how great the future is going to be when their incentives and their pay and their performance are going to be dictated by, it's not about how big this is in the future because I'm not going to get paid for it. It's about, am I going to lose this? Like, am I going to lose money? Like, how is this going to go wrong in the interim? And 
to reduce those like that surface area of risk and to reduce like how things can go wrong is really critically important for this technology to um, gain mass adoption. On the other side, I think those traditional like institutions are missing really two big things. One, crypto makes a bunch of promises about what it is and it's really shitty for a lot of things. Like, but one thing that it is extremely good at is being a shared database. Like, Crypto is not a marketplace or blockchain technology is not a marketplace. It's a marketplace that's enabled by everybody being on a shared ledger. And a shared ledger is something that I think almost everybody in traditional finance could understand deeply and, and like internalize the value of that. And then the second thing is there is imp- like this, <laughs> this ecosystem, this infrastructure, it's improving. Like, when I started my job at City in 2014, the analysts when I left in 2021 were still doing the same thing on a day-to-day basis as what I was doing as a first-year analyst in 2014, right? We've been working in this ecosystem and building in it for the last year and a half. And what we're doing today is dramatically different than a year and a half ago because there's better infrastructure. There's better technology. We're also learning. We're also developing. And if you're continuing to innovate and to move forward and to improve, right? Even if you're starting from a very low base, like you're going to surprise a lot of people when these things compound on top of each other over time. Um, And, uh, and I think maybe some people are waking up to that, but the vast majority of people in traditional finance still think about their infrastructure, their day to day as this kind of ossified thing that it can't, that it, just won't change. It is how it is. And in our space, I think we don't, we never take for granted that nothing is how it is. <laughs> like everything is constantly <laughs> changing. Um, and that's the exciting part for me. Yeah. I think that's a great irony, right? Is that the technology is meant to eliminate manual errors and these little fat finger, right? That sends a deal by 10 X uh, by just accident. It's meant to remove errors from the system. And these, these things that can evolve from data discrepancies and yet it's the fear of an error originating from the system that is like the the thing that's holding back a lot of adoption from what I'm, I'm hearing. It's like that, again, the brand risk, the personal risk, career risk, all of that. It's like, I hope this thing doesn't have an issue when the current systems are plenty issue prone. It just is I mean, better than putting your neck out there. I, I couldn't agree more with that, but Kevin said something really important. It's the thousand X problem. If you're going to yeah. be anything anywhere near the word blockchain or crypto, it's why aren't you trying to target a thousand X return for me? And so, you know, from the traditional investors that may think to allocate to a fund that targets, you know, token, tokenized assets, you know, that's probably going to be their conclusion just as much as it would be, Hey, doesn't this sound like the same thing I can get in the traditional space, but slightly more risky, if not significantly more risky. And the crypto people are going to say, why would I ever need something that low yielding? Um, obviously generalized, but I think that's a really, really important point to, to nail down. That There's a little bit of a gulch of understanding between TradFi and DeFi with respect to tokenized assets. Pete, go ahead. I, I would... Yeah, I was going to say from from my perspective, it's what's interesting is that on the, the, the well, first, our competitors at Arter Winston are f- few and far between. You, you have this sort of um, uh, fractionalization of single artworks group that I think actually plays a great role in fractionalization of art. You know, make I can't argue against that. Um, but obviously the business model is different, right? They're not looking at kind of unknown emerging artists that may that may 100x in value. Um, the the second is just kind of like a collector, you know, l- looking at emerging artists on their own. Again, you know, frankly, it's the same service that we're providing to our LPs. So it's a little less of a, you know, whether blockchain is involved or not where it really matters is on the trusted information. So the vision for our business, you know, is for our registry to be the source of truth and record for any due diligence, authenticity, supporting documentation.
Hey, can anybody hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Does it sound like a few it's, people dropped off? Yeah, I think somebody's mic went out. Um, well, <laughs> so. I, I, on my end, it looks like we lost Morgan and Kevin. Oh, I think we got them back. All right, I'm adding them back up there. Can you guys hear me? Possibly. Yeah. Morgan, I feel like Kevin, all of Pete, our audio Colin. just went... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What happened? I don't know. Who, was it? It was Pete that was we speaking, lost, right? And I think we lost. I think lost Pete went out there too. Yeah. Um, Morgan, I think, I think we've got you've got one more question you want to touch on. If uh, if our guests are back in the chat, I, I'm not sure if they. Do. I did have a question, but I don't know where they went. Was it something we? Was it something Pete said? What? How did we do that? I don't know. Let me see if they can join. We were just at the end. It just seems like a really odd thing that, like, oh, I see those three just. Dropped. I see Kevin uh, join back in, and I see Pete and Colin too. You'll probably just need to get their speakers. Okay. So, there's Colin. He's adding it. Colin, can you hear us? Yeah. And this is why everyone should go to rwa.xyz. <laughs> yeah. And now you got time. Um, I see. I don't even. See... Oh, there we go. There's one. Actually, I see Pete and Kev, but they're both um, listeners. Yep, there's Pete. All right. Yeah, we lost like every speaker <laughs> except for that. It was too much, too much alpha, Pete. They they had to shut you down. I know, Pete. We were it's listening to like Kevin. That's what it's all about. We're changing what? the world here. That was, that was <laughs> weird. They don't. They're listen. They don't want us to to figure this out. <laughs> Pete, I know you were cut off. I'm not sure if you remember what no, you were saying. No, I was just saying that, like our thought. problem from a competitor standpoint is just like a different. It's a different type of problem of like, you know, what would I tell the traditional art investment fund? Like, go find one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I think from my perspective, it's more of if you're investing in art as an asset class part of your portfolio how are you going to go about doing that one aspect of it is just straight up the basics like fundamentals are you buying an auction or buying private are you paying buyer premium therefore of 10 to 15 percent at auction or not are you when you sell are you paying sellers commissions of 10 to 15 percent or are you partnering with winston art group like we are to actually negotiate and and, uh, and and minimize, if not evaporate those costs. Second layer is what are you going to buy? And on that front, it's like we will only buy trusted artwork. Trusted artwork qualifies for a registry. If it does not qualify for a registry, we will not trust it. it will, that there, you know, in other words, it has not gone through the due diligence process that Winston and you know our team has actually defined. Um, and the the Therefore, the competitive advantage is buying trusted and transacting in trusted artwork, providing various financial services to it. Um, and again, like, what would I tell my competitors? It's, you know, there, there, aren't, there aren't many to talk to, for better or worse. Um, for better, for sure. Pete, I think you, you touched on one thing, well, a, a lot of points, but one, one thing that I would note that just been like a thematic observation in meeting with so many of these um, like on-chain tokenization protocols, which I know you guys all have as well and, and do on a daily basis is sometimes the supply of assets kind of self-selects for like not the best asset supply, right? Like there's a reason why they feel like they need to tap into like on-chain or crypto native capital because they don't have access for a variety of reasons, but sometimes it's just not, it's just because it's not the best quality of assets. And so that's one thing that I think, like, we... What are you yeah. using blockchain tech for? 
right? Yeah. Is it to raise capital? Is it to create liquidity? Is it to build better rails, right? And I think that's what a lot of Kevin spoke about is like the better rails aspect. Yeah. Um, and, but the use of it, if, if it's just to raise cheap capital, like, you know, if you believe in efficient markets, there should only be so much room there. I think, you know, longer term liquidity, you raise a fund institutionally, you build a portfolio, it, you know, it's like IPOing a, um, a private equity real estate fund into a REIT format, right? Um, I think that to me personally are the bigger opportunities for art and collectibles. I don't think that's broadly the case, um, but I think that, you know, the art and collectible space, it's less around accessing new capital sources and more to me about the collateral security, asset security, um, trustworthy information and assets. And then longer term, bring high quality products to market for financing, for liquid, you know, liquidity, if you wanted to do that. Um, you know, and then on the on the capital raising side, I think it's much more opportunistic, you know. And I think there's certain jurisdictions that are certainly, you know, um, the the investors there are, are much more engaged in the tokenization market and are more appropriate for investing in tokenism. I agree. <laughs> okay, we're running up right at the end of our uh, our scheduled session. Uh, Pete, Kevin, Colin, any final words before? Uh, I'm guessing, and I'm feeling like this will be just your first appearance of hopefully many uh, coming back to join us on this because it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. Thank you guys for having us. Uh, thank you guys and girls for having us. And um... Yeah, I mean, I think final word is uh, shout out to Avalanche and Avalanche Vista for putting their money where their mouth is. So I think a lot of the conversations that we've had with different L1 foundations, with different investors, different protocols, um, you know, it's become very clear over the past year and a half that the only person in the space who was buying tokenized assets was us, really. Um, and... I think to not be alone in that is hugely impactful and I think is a small step because we're, you know, talking, we're two minnows in a huge market, but hopefully there is, you know, hopefully we're just the first of many. Um, and uh, yeah, just really, really uh, excited to see what happens, uh, what happens next. Kev just earned the automatic re-invitation with that answer. Um, <laughs> That's right, man. Always, always pander and never hurts. <laughs> uh, no, I, I have had a total pleasure. You know, it's been awesome being on. Morgan, thank you for letting me know. And uh, Patrick for hosting. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I was going to say, what am I going to say? You know, thank you, Avalanche. We are... Uh, obviously in discussions around doing some other development and I think really what the industry needs is putting you know eating or cooking you know be that on the risk side uh, sponsorship uh, if nothing else then, then you know fostering the ecosystem the, the pie is massive it's the whole set of capital markets so I think there's a massive opportunity for Avalanche and the group of us to to lead the charge. We're just using all the all the idioms today. Pedal to the metal, money where our mouth is, walk the walk, rubber hits the road. <laughs> I used like thirty percent of those. <laughs> but yeah, I would I would echo Patrick. Thank you guys so much for for joining. I mean, we I know we talk pretty frequently, but I, I thought this was an awesome opportunity to kind of bring our, our community and the broader tokenization space kind of together and to hear the like valuable nuggets that, that we get from you guys day in and day out. So really appreciate you guys all being here. Yeah, and to everyone listening, make sure you um, give these guys a follow. And um, yeah, you can follow up with questions there, I'm sure. Um, but they'll be happy to answer. Or if not, then there's probably some uh, disclosure reasons or otherwise why they can't. And that just means that they're 
that plugged in. So um, with that, we'll close this one out. Really appreciate everybody joining and uh, we'll do this again soon. Thanks. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone.